I don't know what we're talking. What, what are we talking about? Oh wait, we're talking about us being obsolete, right? Us, yes, definitely, definitely, well, definitely me. <laughs> are you? Oh, by the way, is your lower third okay? My lower third, uh, yeah. Is that Looking fine? You in the technical technical jargon, yeah, perfect. Good. All right. Um, yeah. Welcome to Tips from the Top Floor, Alan. How are you doing? Where do I look? Do I look at the camera? But you're like right there. You know, so okay, I'm trying I, to figure it's, out. It's not important. This is a this is an audio podcast first and foremost. And uh, for anyone listening to this, this part only this part is in video, so you can go over to YouTube. Uh, link is uh, in the show notes, and you can watch this part on video. And the rest is audio because I've decided that if I do tips from the top floor in video and audio, then I won't make enough episodes because it's way too much hassle. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just putting things, pieces of the show on video. And gotcha. if you're listening, then go to video. If you're watching on video, uh, just know there's more in front of this and after this. So there's a link to the audio. So let's see if this works. I have no idea if this works. How much, okay. how much video do you do? You do? You're a video guy. Uh, like video work, video YouTube. I do. I do nothing right now. COVID, nothing. COVID. I know that. That's why you having me on is probably a horrible <laughs> error. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. We can talk about all the things I wish I was doing. Well, in the in in, in one of the last episodes, we talked about ten years of uh, the invisible camera. So that's uh, the one thing that we don't have to repeat in this episode. Because um, it's there if you haven't seen it. Description has the links. Um, yeah, and then we decided to bring you on this show and talk about things. And uh, we want to talk about f us being obsolete, right? Obsolescence. Yeah. Haven't you always been obsolete though? When when did you first feel like you were obsolete? <laughs> I'm I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure. Um, yeah, you, you're right. I, I don't think I was ever not obsolete in one way or another, right? Yeah, I was, it was not, nothing I was ever concerned about. I think we, we, I've, I've heard of many, many milestones along the technology road. Um, <laughs> I've said, oh, well, yeah, well, you, we're going to be obsolete. The sky is falling. And, and that, you read this on all the blogs and see it on people talking about it and what about this, what about this? I never felt that way. Even as the technology marched on, well, we're going to two megapixel cam cameras now, you're, you're out of a job. Well, I, I never felt that way. I mean, I think we can look at it from, from two different perspectives. There's the technology perspective and then there's the, um, is, is someone who knows how to handle a camera still needed, right? Um, a good example, a good example of obsolescence in photography uh, goes back to 2013, which is um, when the you, you will remember this when the Chicago Sun Times, big newspaper in the U.S., uh, laid off their entire uh, photography staff. Right, everyone, 28 people, poof, gone from one day to the other, um, and they 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 just replaced them with well the reporters who were out there doing the stories anyway and just gave them iPhones and said take you take the photos now <sighs> yeah, that yeah that started even earlier I mean in where I'm from in Vancouver I know a lot of the the reporters were doing that they just did I playing sports and, and growing up playing uh, baseball we, we always knew the photographer who right. would come out a guy named Mark great photographer yeah and uh, he just stopped coming and ultimately, the the reporter said, "Yeah, they, they just had me take a couple of snaps with my, at the time, probably like a Nikon, thirty one hundred or twenty one hundred or whatever they were called, a little two megapixel point and shoot, and that was good enough for the newspaper. They were done." Yeah, and and it's it's I think it really depends on where you are because I grew up in a small town in the south of Germany, and uh, it's. I think one of the one of the papers had a real staff photographer and the other newspaper didn't. So from the start, they were pretty much doing double duty. And uh, yeah, it showed in the photography. <laughs> I mean, it clearly did because there was there was nothing. Um, there was nothing really photographic about the photography. It was more like capturing the event, someone shaking someone else's hand, handing over a big 
fake check and stuff like that because uh, yep. that, that was the important stuff to have it on the shot but it wasn't important that it looked nice it was well framed that didn't really have any importance back then or or very flattering that's what i noticed the big jump would be you know the old old action photos would be taken with like a long lens you'd have like a 400 millimeter lens it would look fantastic the framing would be great the action would be perfect depth of field would be amazing everybody looked great like professionals and then after that it was like well but this is what happened but you know you're shooting people with a wide angle lens up close and not tremendously flattering uh but it it served the purpose i mean i think newspapers were on the way out so you know you're fighting a dying battle uh, but even back then, like when I first started getting into digital photography and my first DSLR, which I still have over there, by the way, the 40D will not die, no matter hmm. what I do to it. I take it in the in the Mediterranean; it will not it will not stay there. Um, <laughs> but I, that that was a 10 10 mega 12 10 megapixel, regardless 10 megapixel camera, and that's when I heard, you know, oh yeah, you're going to be obsolete. And um, at that point. Let's say a professional with any any decent camera would be taking pictures here, and then the average Joe with the iPhone four would get to about here. That's mm-hmm. about where they could get to. You know, earlier down, it was it was quite low. But then the iPhone four probably came around, maybe the five. I'm you, not sure. You're talking you're talking uh, camera quality wise. You're talking picture quality wise. Yeah, picture quality. I mean, but still, I it, I think there was some. Con- even even though the 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 uh, the smartphones and I think we are in, inevitably going to end up talking about how smartphones are taking over, but of course the smartphones are also taking um, taking creative decisions for you now. They are not just making right. sure the shot is well exposed and in focus. Um, they do um, a smartphone nowadays. When you press that button, it has already taken pictures for four seconds, and it keeps taking after you stop pressing the button. There's there's a whole stream of photos that is being taken all the time. And then once you press that button, it pretty much tries to make a decision which of those photos to choose and combine and so on. And I'm pretty sure that there's already some automatic automatisms in there in terms of um, making sure the person has their eyes open and that kind of stuff, because that information is there at that point. So well, that's how I shoot generally. Like, like I always have. I've always shot in like at least a three three burst mode for that reason. So I can you know snap three quick ones and pick the one that's best in focus, the best mm-hmm. with the eyes open, etc. Later on, and uh, so it's nice to know that they're doing it for us. Well, they're not just that. They're not just selecting one. They are combining four, five, six, seven photos together right. and uh, take the best part of each and uh, and combine them into like at different ex- at different shutter speeds even so for like night photography um they have long exposures in there and they combine two or three and make sure everything is nice and sharp and uh all this all that stuff that that us skillful pros um know how to do is Mm -hmm. a lot of that is now in the cameras yeah and, and like i said i'm okay with that so back in the day the iphone 4 got you here and then now it's it's still getting you here. It's not getting you all the way. That's what I find. Like there's you still, still need to. Yes. Well, there's still, as the Germans say, the Augenblick, right? But well, I mean, that's that's the other side of photography that we can talk about. Um, in the end, the actual timing decision um, is still yours to make. The framing is still yours to make. Those cameras don't do framing for you. Um, those cameras. Those those cameras don't do the interaction for you. Like if you shoot pictures of people, um, there is way more than just taking that picture and making it technically good. But you have to speak to that person. You have to interact with that person. You have to get that person to be at ease with you. You have to get that person to, I don't know, do something in front of the camera. The the first time I I remember the first time I did like a like a proper photo session with someone that was really awkward because I wasn't. I hadn't practiced that. I didn't really right. uh, know how to how to open up their their shell, how to how to bring them out of that uh, from from behind that barrier that everyone is kind of behind when they have a camera, a big fat camera pointed at them. 
I find the big difference now is it, it, it was the same for me, and it still it still is the same because I want people to behave naturally, but I also want to bring them out of their shell, and and that's hard to do. What do you? How do you do that to each individual person? But I find the big challenge now, especially in the last five years, with the the complete blow up of smartphones. Like every, like every, at this point, every single person has it. Some people's smartphones have their own smartphones at this point. It's gotten out of hand. <laughs> yes. Which means most everybody is aware that they are on camera right. at all times. And they behave accordingly. So I see a lot of, especially younger people, behaving in, in person as if they are on the Instagram currently. Which I think you kind of per permanently are now anyway, because there's cameras everywhere. Oh, and by the right. way, after after the last uh, 12 months, people are way more used to speaking into a camera, to talking to a camera than they've ever been before. Yeah, that's true. I guess they're a lot more aware of, well, their background and if they're wearing pants. Um, are you? Spoiler. Maybe. The 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 but but what I find hard I find difficult is to get people to be the best version of themselves and not the best Instagram version of themselves, which is what they're always constantly aware of. Like I'll take pictures of people like for portraits or whatever, and they, they oftentimes are disappointed that they don't look like the Instagram filter version yep. of themselves. Yep. I say, well, that but that's not real though. Like I, what I'm going to do, I, 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 I kind of have a a strict personal Photoshop policy. Um, like if I take your picture and there's something temporary on your face, a blemish or something like that, happily happy to remove it. If you have something that's permanent, um, like I remember a, a client a, a long time ago had their newborn baby and she felt like like the kid had slightly pointed ears. <laughs> Could you change the, my but, baby's ears? Really? Well, that's the thing. The, the kid, the kid was like six days old. So you know, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of changes to come. But she had asked me, "Hey, can you can you fix the ears?" And I said, "No, no, I, I won't. Uh -huh. I, I won't do it uh, because the kid's ears are, are going to be fine. He's not an elf. He's going to be just fine. But you'll want to remember this time. You don't want me to change the the past for when you look at this in the future. Hmm. So." Uh, but people are disappointed by that, and and so I still think that there is a level of ability that a good photographer brings with a decent camera, but that gap is closing, and the perception is in the client's eyes. So I, I know I can tell the difference difference between my photos and someone else's computational iPhone photo. That looks amazing, by the way, like with the depth of field and, oh, and the whole tricks they're doing. And and it's and it's good enough for most people. That's the interesting thing. Um, yes. It, I, I remember just a, a few months ago, not a few months ago, <laughs> feels like a few months ago, <laughs> before COVID. Um, I, the time has no meaning now. No, it doesn't. I was, I was at my parents' place and my mother needed a new photo for her website because she has that cookbook thing going on and... Uh, she needed a new photo for some publication. And um, of course, she didn't tell me up front, so I didn't bring my, in quotes, good camera. Um, so yeah, I decided to find a, a good background, to find a nice spot, good light, and uh, use the iPhone in portrait mode and just um, artificially throw the background of focus. That photo is perfectly good. There is nothing wrong with that photo. And uh, it works really well in the context of a, of a publication. I'm not sure I'd, I'd want to blow it up and uh, print it on the wall. But um, it still, uh, it serves the purpose really, really well because um, of that. But I mean, yes, I think we can agree there is a certain level of uh, a certain motion towards us becoming obsolete in some fields, in some areas or our skills becoming obsolete in some areas. And I'm and okay with that. I, I, for me, it's, it, that's an opportunity to, to expand, to do other things. Um, I always look at this like I, I, I remember way back, one of the other fallacies of, of being a professional photographer is that you, know, you have to, to work for a low price and, and you know, so you'll have a client come in and you'll, you'll give them a, a, an estimate for $1,000, 1,000 euros, let's say. And they look at you and they say, well, I was expecting to pay 200 euros. Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so now, yeah, exactly. But now you're kind of, you, at some point in your career, you felt sort of obliged to work with them and figure something out. But early on, I realized, okay, that job was never mine. It was never going to happen. So I never looked at it like, okay, I'm out a thousand euros now. I just, I didn't take the job and realized it was never going to be mine. Mm-hmm. And that's how I feel about photography now is that if, if somebody says to me, okay, great, like I can do 80% with my iPhone, what do I need you for? I think, yeah, you don't. You don't need me. I'll do something else. And and by the way, being able to replace a lot of that with a smartphone is, of course, it's, it's changing perception of people. Um, I remember when I got into... Uh, f- into pro photography and uh, I didn't have any budget. So uh, the DSLR I got was the 300D, the first digital rebel by Canon, which was silver. And it was massively frowned upon by professionals because it wasn't black. So um, there is a certain or there used to be, I'm not sure. um, But uh, but at least back then there there used to be the the need to, uh, to convince your customer to convince the client that you are worth your salt, that you are worth being paid because you have the big equipment and you have uh, the the camera to show for it, even though it doesn't matter. The camera does not matter. You can shoot pictures, really good pictures with an iPhone. But what would happen nowadays if you came to a professional job and just used your iPhone? Wouldn't that be in the perception of the of the client be as if they, I don't know, asked their their son <laughs> to take those photos? I always wonder that because, yeah, I always also wonder if I show up for a job driving, uh, you know, like a beat up old car that's barely running, how will the client that's, feel like? Why that's am I why you park around the corner. You park around the corner, take that's the bus, something like that. But or, or or if you show up with a, you know, in a brand new Ferrari, they think, well, I'm now I'm overpaying you. You know, like either way, you feel like you're overpaying because what, what where is that money going? Um, you have but, to wear it with pride. That's what you have to do. That's right. But I, I, I remember having to sort of feel the need to justify your equipment as well. And you want to look the part. And I find now it, this is a blessing, though, because, yeah, you're right. If you show up with an iPhone, you're probably not going to get paid, which is the sad reality. But I find where I bring value, where, where, where the customer can't get to, is in time. And, and because I can shoot things very, very quickly in the first or second shot, and that's that. And in the past, I used to try to kind of justify that by taking longer because a client would come over for a photo shoot. I know I have it in four seconds. I know I have what they want, but I felt like I needed to kind of put a half an hour in to make sure they feel that, like they got their money's worth. Yep. Whereas now I don't feel that. I think they kind of understand that I'm saving them time. Thus, that's why it costs money. There's a there's a uh, some some audiobooks you can get cheaper unabridged and more expensive abridged because that will save people time. I did not know that. Yeah, it's weird. So you pay more for the for the shortened version, which doesn't have all the content. But someone took the time and effort to make it shorter for you and uh, quicker to. So I used to always to buy the director's cut DVD and was mostly disappointed. It was over, always longer. You're overpaying. There's a reason it was cut. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, uh, there's there's interesting things happening right now. There's consolidation in the in the uh, in the stock photography market. I mean, Getty bought iStock Photo. They now bought Unsplash. So they, um, for those who don't know, Unsplash.com is this free photography portal, um, which is now under. Under Getty, and apparently they don't want to change anything, but um, they are kind of grabbing pieces of the market here and there, um, which I find interesting because a lot of the photos on Unsplash are professional grade, but they are not made by professionals. So creativity. And you can and license these for free? Well, I've not been on Unsplash. That's how Un- Unsplash I is. Unsplash I is. It started, I think, off as a community of uh, just let's exchange photos. So if you need a photo for your blog, um, go to Unsplash, get one, and uh, you can just use it. Don't, no credit required, nothing. And photographers just want to get, give back to that community. That's how it started, but it became bigger. And I think their business model was access to an API. So there's like some 
tools that have Unsplash built in um, as a photo source. So if you want to write an article in some tool um, and need, an, uh, need a picture of, I don't know, yellow flowers, then uh, you can just add one without having to go to uh, an expensive stock site or something. Um, but that's now under Getty. So there's a consolidation in the market. There's a consolidation in the camera market. I mean, if you look at the sales figures for DSLRs, I'm 100% sure the, the, the DSLRs that I own right now, that those are going to be the last cameras with a mirror that I will own. There's no I question feel the same about way. that. Yeah. There's no it, question I, about that. Yeah, but you and I have different needs. I mean, for me, I... I love the fact that, that there are now mirrorless cameras that make that hybrid video uh, photo leap much, much smaller. Like it's, it's such an easy thing to do. The DSLR shoots great video, but it's cumbersome. And so for mm -hmm. me, that, that technology is fantastic. Uh, I don't know how it's going to be. I, I, don't, I don't know what it's going to be like to shoot photos with, like that. Have you shot much with the mirrorless? Uh, no, I've, I've I've played with them. Uh, Monica has a, a Nikon Z6, I think, um, which is a brilliant camera. It's it's really brilliant. The reason I was a bit hesitant in the past was because they were still not as fast in terms of um, in terms of the um, in terms of the the, the, the live view because it's a screen, mm -hmm. it's being processed. So, uh, but that is pretty much real time now. So that's not the problem. Um, they're not as battery hungry anymore, still more battery hungry than uh, DSLRs, but it's not really as much of a difference as it used to be. Um, so I'd, I'd be happy to use one technically. And you have lots of advantages. I mean, what you see is what you get um, mm -hmm. is, is, is certainly helpful. And they are way more video focused as well, but still cover the, uh, the still photo part. Now, becoming obsolete or becoming obsolete in certain areas, um, what are we going to do about this? How, how, do, how are you countering that obsolescence? Are you doing anything um, outside of the photography? Because some of that will go to, uh, in air quotes, amateurs, people who are not doing this uh, full time, for example. Um, I weep openly for the first three hours of the day, and, we and, all then, do. and then uh, after that, no, I, this started a couple of years ago, and it wasn't even an obsolescence for me. It was a shift that uh, I was feeling very, very unfulfilled with photography. Not with photography, but with the digital nature of it, and uh, yeah. the fact that, that even though I, I do print most of my work, which you can't see here, it's not, not there. Um, you're, you're, a bit like, like I, you're a bit like Johnny Ive uh, in this white room, just that yours is blue. That's right. That's right. Uh, I was hoping you were going to Superman blue screen me here. But uh, <laughs> the so I, I was feeling very unfulfilled with a lot of my work was essentially ones and zeros on a hard drive somewhere. And I, I just I, I like taking photos. I, I, I'm not bowing out of it. I, I continue to do it. My kids are uh, seven and ten years old almost. And so I take a lot of photos of them and still I still work you know, professionally in photos and video. But it's those ones and zeros that I can't touch. And, and so a couple of years ago, I decided, you know what, I really needed to get into, into woodworking. I wanted to build something I could touch. And so a year ago, coincidentally, right at the beginning of, of this mess we find ourselves <laughs> in with the pandemic, I started doing that. I started building a shop in my, in my uh, basement with a table saw and all the saws that you need. I uh, still have 10 fingers, by the way. Do you, do you, do you have a background in that? I, I know your father did a lot of that. Yeah, I grew up, my dad had a shop, still does, uh, in, in Vancouver. And I grew up doing that. But like any kid, I at some point, I just didn't care anymore. I wanted sure. to play baseball, and play road hockey with my friends and those sorts of things. And so I kind of didn't, I just stopped doing it and kind of wanted to get back into it. And so speaking of obsolescence, this is the, this is, the opposite of that is YouTube. Have you heard of YouTube? Uh, I think for barely, but yeah, I think I know what it is. It's like Vimeo, but like way bigger, I think. Ah, there we go. And so on, if you go onto YouTube, there are a ton. There's, there's, there's a million different woodworkers putting out 
tutorial videos. I'm well and aware of that, yes. Five, five good guys who do it, uh, who do it well. And uh, so I, I, I follow them and, I'm, and the long story short is I've been building, learning to build furniture. Um, self-taught via these other guys. This is interesting. So so there's this saying um, that uh, during during the gold rush, the people who make who made the money were not the gold diggers, but those who sold them the shovels. And yeah. uh, for for me, I mean, th there was always this element of imminent obsolescence in some way because I, you know me, I love teaching. And um, a lot of that over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years went to YouTube, as you just said, right? Um, mm -hmm. so, so the workshops have, oh, your camera just went off. Yeah, yeah, keep going. <laughs> so um, with that, the the workshops have changed. They have um, they have pretty much st they're still relevant, but um, they have the the community experience part has become more important. The meeting other people part has become more important because that is impossible to replicate online and. Um, like the, the quick chat over uh, the coffee break, um, we're social beings. So that part of it was always kind of important and it's, it's becoming more important. Now, of course, for the last year, there were no workshops, but um, mm -hmm. anyway, um, same with the travel. Travel, it, being there is still valued high. Being there at the actual spot, you can watch videos as much as you like, but being there is, is um, has more value. But uh, of course, now there's uh, the whole we can't travel thing. And even if we could, there's the whole climate thing. So um, that's a, that's an area that I am still struggling with at this point. But um, yeah, but you, you I mean, you, you made the shift very, very early on that with the, the workshops and the travel workshops as well, because um, where, where I first noticed the, the, the big shift online is is actually uh, my, my first experience with that would be someone like David Hobby, Strobist, mm -hmm. who I had up, up to that point, I had never seen anybody just give knowledge away like that. <laughs> yes. he, he was happy to do it. Like he, he just it probably still is, you know, I guess he just doesn't run the blog as much, but that was a very transformative experience for me when I was learning photography. Because I went to film school and learned, you know, we made movies and that, and I moved to Germany. Always loved photography, but when I moved to Germany, I spoke zero German, and so I, I it was difficult to make movies. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't edit work here. So I made the shift into photography, and he was a big help in that. Is is reading his blog and getting up to speed on? Okay, well, how do you do flash photography? How do you do off camera flash? What is it? Like I had, I had no background in it. And he put it out there. And everything else I had read up to that point was, well, I'll tell you a little bit. And then but, you have to buy the program. And then buy the program, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that was that was kind of my approach from, from, the, from the very first podcast uh, that I recorded was um, this, this is a free resource and I love giving this away and stuff will come back in some way or another. And that has proven to be, uh, to be, to be working, to be right um over the years it, even though in the beginning that was really tough but um but i think i believe and i've always worked this way is that as a photographer nowadays um you you have to set yourself up in a, in a bit of a broader fashion right for uh for me that is things that are all still in the realm of photography but I don't know, there's the online coaching, there's uh, some commercial video production work that I do on the side. Um, there's there's even consulting for remote video productions, but it all stays in that realm of photography. Um, and interestingly enough, even when I started doing this full time, I never trusted in it staying that way. Right. I knew that change is inevitable. And so uh, kind of instinctively from the start, I set myself up with several legs to stand on, so to speak. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought of that at the time. I mean, when I started our podcast, The Two Hosers, and we, we give away everything for free. We tell you everything, you know, you hopefully want to know as a beginner. Um, 
and it was never never designed to be uh, okay. Now we'll substitute the paywall in there. Look, let's figure out how to how to make money on this. It was how do I expand that into other areas where I do add value? I try to always be a value add to any situation I'm in, not just how do I extract money? Because I find that you spend more of your time trying to figure out how to extract the money than you do adding value. That is very true. I've learned that the hard way in a few instances. Sure, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, no. So, so uh, that that's that's my that's been my mantra from the start: do do good things or try to do good things, and good things will come back to you, in one way or another. So that's I, how you that's how you avoid obsolescence. Yeah, I, and I think that's that's a good thing to 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 um, close that circle. We. I think we can acknowledge that we are going to be obsolete in some ways. Or what you do is obsolete changes everywhere, changes always, changes uh, just a factor that you have to to factor in from the start. And uh, I think my, my biggest piece of advice would be to don't set yourself up to, for just one thing because that might bite you later down the road. I second that. How about that? Okay. Alan, um, you just mentioned the two hosers, twohosers.com. That's where we can find two you. Twohosers.com. You can go find everything you want to know about hosers, I guess. Well, I think you explained it to me a long time ago. Hosers is something Canadian. It's a, it's a slang for Canadian, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, should I should I ask further or will I just Google you can, it? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, I, I don't know the actual, the actual, uh, uh, I've heard stories about where it came from, but there's a famous, famous story about Bob and Doug McKenzie, two Canadian uh, uh, characters from SCTV, uh, Dave Thomas, Rick Moranis, you may, may, maybe you've heard of him. That maybe one not. I know, yep. Okay, so they, they, they were doing a show, so back in the old days, and maybe today still, I don't know how it worked, in Canada... The Canadian TV stations, they wanted more Canadian content. It's all about CanCon, CanCon, CanCon. Bring more Canadian stuff. So they decided they were going to go so over the top and just make a complete mockery of the Canadian content. And they did the most Canadian thing of all time. And uh, so they had the show, uh, it's the Great White, the Bob and Doug McKenzie. What's the show called? The Great White North. And uh, so you can see those on the, you can find them on YouTube now. I highly recommend them. Very, very funny. And that was where Adam uh, Schwartz and I, that's where we got our name from because it was two hosers doing a, a photo show and that became the two hosers photo show. All right. So go everyone, go check it out. Everything for the beginning photographer and getting more and more advanced over the years. So uh, if you, you are way beyond the, this is what shutter speed is and uh, this is what an aperture is. Um, we yeah, that was the be that was ten years ago. That was the beginning. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when we first started, Adam knew absolutely nothing. He didn't know how to open the box, how to get the camera out, and that's where we started. And now he's a pro. Now, now he, he's a pro. Yeah, he can. He's got like four or five off-camera flashes. He can do it all. Yeah. All right, Alan. Thank you so much. Thank you.